The Chicago Cubs 2016 World Series victory broke a century-long spell of hexes, blunders, letdowns, and just regular old losing. Cubs fans suffered quite a while waiting for this moment. Their freshest scar came from 2003, when a division winner lost the NLCS in a collapse best known for this iconic moment, the so-called Steve Bartman incident. And in the scope of Cubs disasters, that 03 nightmare stands out as the absolute worst, but not because of that moment. This is the worst Cubs playoff inning ever. October 14th, 2003, Wrigley Field, Chicago, Illinois. The Cubs led the Marlins three games to two in the National League Championship Series. They were up three runs to nothing in game six. The Marlins had opened the eighth inning with a flyout, but had a man on second after Juan Pierre doubled. Five more outs, and the Cubs would go to the World Series. If you remember one thing from this game, it's this next moment. Mark Pryor, who started the game, was still pitching. Luis Castillo was at bat, and the two of them had battled to a full count. Castillo then hit a foul ball down the line that left fielder Moises Alou may have been able to catch over the wall for the second out of the inning if fans, including the deeply unfortunate Steve Bartman, didn't get in the way. Bartman became the scapegoat for everything that followed, and there's a 30 for 30 documentary, Alex Gibney's Catching Hell, that does a great job investigating the reasons why. Alou's demonstrative reaction, excessive TV replays, and other spectators harassing Bartman all contributed to his infamy. We're walking a fine line now, but you know, a fan's getting out of control and doing something that they shouldn't do. All of this must be understood within the context of Cubs fans believing they were cursed. Chicago had last won a World Series in 1908. Their most recent World Series appearance was in 1945, a loss frequently referenced because of the incident in which a tavern owner and his pet goat, who had a ticket, by the way, were denied entry into Wrigley Field. The tavern owner angrily put a hex on the team. And indeed, since the curse of the billy goat, the Cubs had not returned to the Fall Classic. They'd hardly achieved any postseason success at all. Before this 03 run, Chicago's only recent playoff appearance was 1998, when NL MVP Sammy Sosa and Rookie of the Year ace Kerry Wood were just enough to earn Chicago a wild card berth and an NLDS sweep at the hands of the Braves. So in 2003, the Cubs winning Game 5 in Atlanta to upset the Braves in the NLDS and snatching two NLCS wins in Florida to make Game 6 a potential series clincher and scoring three runs in Game 6 while Pryor held the Marlins scoreless, this was all pretty new and exciting. Chicago's first World Series berth since 45 was well within reach and Cubs fans felt different, good, confident even. So with all that context, and with everything that followed, you can see why this weird, unfortunate moment gets outsized attention. But it wasn't the first bad thing to happen that inning. We've already mentioned that Pierre hit a one-out double. And while many bad things were to come, it's not like they directly resulted from an uncaught foul ball. Yes, two outs would have been better than one, but Alou might not have made this tough play even unobstructed. Curses and hypotheticals aside, the situation following the Bartman incident remained as it was before. Castillo at the plate, one out, full count. Nothing was worse, but everything was about to get worse because of, you know, the Cubs. The first mistake was Pryor's. The announcers had recently pointed out that the Cubs didn't need to call in their bullpen. Even after well over 100 pitches, the starter was still dealing. He hasn't shown any reason to have any activity. Nope, stuff's the same. But once again, facing three balls and two strikes, the all-star pitcher's next offering was in the dirt. The wild pitch ball four put Castillo on first and let Juan Pierre advance to third. Here was a red flag. And here was another. Pryor served Ivan Rodriguez an absolute meatball that Pudge fouled off, and then Pryor gave up an RBI single. 3-1, one, one out, men on first and second. Now what? Now would Cubs manager Dusty Baker pull his starter who showed signs of wearing down? And decision time now for Dusty Baker. Does he give the ball to Kyle Farnsworth in the bullpen? Or does he leave Pryor out there on the mound? No, Pryor stayed out there. Two important things about this decision. One, for a manager of some very good teams, Dusty Baker presided over more than his fair share of meltdowns and closeout games his teams repeatedly fell apart on the cusp of series victory. 
after this, in 2012, Baker's Cincinnati Reds would blow a 2-0 series lead in the NLDS against the Giants. In 2016, Baker's Washington Nationals would blow a 2-1 series lead in the NLDS against the Dodgers. But in this moment, there could only have been one collapse on Dusty Baker's mind. Baker managed the San Francisco Giants the previous year and led them to a 3-2 lead in the 2002 World Series. In Game 6, with an opportunity to close out the Angels and win it all, Baker pulled starting pitcher Russ Ortiz in the seventh inning of a 5-0 shutout. The Giants squandered their lead, then the game, then the whole World Series. So perhaps with that in the back of his head, Baker left Pryor out there, and here's where I have to point out thing number two. For a split second, Baker's decision looked like the right one. On his first pitch to star rookie Miguel Cabrera, Pryor induced a ground ball that had a decent chance to become a double play and end the inning until... shit. And bobbled by Gonzalez and everybody's safe. Chicago's Alex Gonzalez, an extremely reliable veteran shortstop, had just 10 errors all year. He picked a devastating moment to commit one more. So, still one out. Base is loaded now, but not because of anything Pryor did wrong. The starters stayed out there to face Derek Lee, who doubled on the first pitch. Tie game. Finally time for Pryor to come out. Kyle Farnsworth entered, hoping to staunch the bleeding. He pitched around all-star Mike Lowell to load the bases, then gave up a sack fly to Jeff Conine, a pretty tolerable outcome considering the alternatives. The Marlins now led, but only by one run, two outs. So Baker had Farnsworth do it again, intentional walk of Todd Hollinsworth to load the bases, just needed one more out against Mike Mordecai, a guy off the bench who was having a pretty mediocre se- uh, shit, 7-3 Marlins. After another Cubs pitching change, Mordecai would eventually come around to score, and then, at last, after eight runs surrendered, the most devastating inning in Cubs history finally came to an end. That, I mean, I don't believe in curses, but that inning made it pretty hard to argue with someone who does. Especially because some previous Cubs playoff disaster innings also hinged on simple boners. The best example, after the Cubs blew a 2-0 series lead in their 1984 NLCS versus the Padres, the decisive Game 5 turned because of one bad inning, which itself turned on one weird error. Chicago was leading and in pretty good shape, but what should have been an easy second out of the seventh inning squirted under Leon Durham's glove and through his legs, opening a cascade of San Diego runs that drowned Chicago's World Series hopes. That moment had a direct parallel in the 03 meltdown, but the broadcast, of course, left the inning more focused on the scene off the field than all the screw-ups that had just taken place on it. And it's a shame. This chapter of the Cubs' century-long tragedy is full of culprits, but Steve Bartman's name always gets top billing. Whether you believe in curses or not, that moment wasn't what made this top of the eighth the worst inning in Cubs history. It was the error. It was the delayed pitching change. It was the failure of a worn out arm and the onslaught that ensued and the eventual knife twisting when the Marlins went on to beat the Yankees in the World Series. It was all of that. It was an avalanche of failure somehow overshadowed by the snowball that preceded it. Thanks for watching The Worst. If you love baseball blunders and goof-em-ups, might I suggest this worst about an absolute train wreck pitching debut, or this rewinder that goes way in depth on what you don't remember about the Bill Buckner game.